Hello. Welcome to School Health Presents Holistic Transitioning. I'm Dr. Ray Hyden. Today's episode focuses on classroom preparation as we get ready for our students to be coming back into the school year next year. We're doing this episode this early in the summer because we really need to be thinking about what will be going on. Already, as schools are planning their comebacks throughout the country, we're hearing a number of different approaches that are being used. So we want to discuss those. We want to discuss some of the realities that go along with that. We want to discuss things that you might already have that will add to making that transition much easier. So as we take a look at what's going on when it comes to classroom preparation, there are some things we continue to hear no matter what state and no matter what group we speak with. The first, of course, is the whole idea of social distancing, maintaining that six foot separation in between our students. Next, we're also hearing about masks. You know, what is going to go on with those masks? How are those masks going to be supplied? And we're gonna talk about that as we go through this video. We'll also talk about disinfecting. What's going to go on? How do we keep our classrooms clean? And what goes into the whole idea of disinfecting as we move on? How is that then going to continue as we move into the school year? And what about some of the other environments that we'll be talking about as we go in? So let's start for a minute with some of the ideas that we have when it comes to disinfecting our classrooms. I'm gonna start on the macro and then kind of work down into the classrooms and the materials themselves. There are different groups out there who actually provide services where they'll come in and they will disinfect an entire area. In most cases, that disinfecting is actually being done in a couple of different ways. One way is almost like the idea of fumigation, where they'll be coming in and pumping different chemicals into the air and letting that, that mist kind of settle down over everything. Usually it's a multi-day process. Specialists are brought in to do something like that. And depending upon which chemical they're using, some of them are Clorox based, some of them are from other names you may not recognize, but are recognized out in the industrial world. They are very effective as to what they're doing. Again, when I say very effective, 99.9% .9 of all germs as we go out there. What you want to gauge though, if you're using a third party group like that, Number one, talk about time frames and talk about the residual effects of whatever chemical it is that they're using. They use different chemicals. There are different approaches to it. Some of the chemicals are dried enough where you're ready to resume classes after about 48 to 72 hours. So what I've seen happen already in some of our schools that have used those services is that they'll begin on perhaps a Friday and then wrap things up on Sunday as that period of time that you need for the disinfectant to actually take place. One of the newer developments that's out there that I actually like because of a lot of the additional ramifications is a system called ProClean. For those of you who haven't heard of it, and it's only been brought to my attention over the last about four weeks, it is a system that's based on the same chemicals that they use in water filtration plants to keep our water clean. And so basically it's oxygen and chlorine that is being used, but it can actually be done by your own district's team as they're coming in. So whether you've got your outside services that are going to come in or having somebody from the inside, they can actually disperse this. It is environmentally safe, and it's something that literally dries onto things within seconds. Why is that a little bit stronger? Well, the way that it's actually dispersed is basically using something similar to static electricity. And that way it's going to adhere to all surfaces and take care of things. The turnaround time for this is a little bit briefer, so you could actually have people coming in Friday right after school taking care of the classrooms in those classrooms ready to go Monday morning. And the residue that's left isn't as slick or as potentially, 
I hate to say dangerous because even the viruses that are there are dangerous, but you don't have as much of a need to wipe everything down afterwards. So that's a system you may want to investigate too. So as you're sharing this with administrators or administrators as you're out there looking at this, take a look at the ProClean system. I like that for, again, a couple of reasons. Number one, it's much less expensive because you're doing it on your own. So you don't have those costs that are incurred by other groups coming in. The second thing that I like about it is, again, it is so environmentally safe rather than always having chemicals within your building. And so it's a different approach that you can take for the benefit of all the students. The other thing is the cost effectiveness side. I have worked with several districts and I've heard some stories about the costs of bringing in third parties, especially early in this when we saw surge pricing going on. There were districts that were actually being charged upwards of a quarter of a million dollars to have a building completely disinfected as we went through. And the question always is, well, what did they really do? So there are good companies out there. Please feel free to use them, but do your homework. There are also things you can do. So that's the macro side. What I would recommend is this. If you are looking ahead and saying, hey, we want to protect at all costs, consider doing that within your buildings at some point over the summer. What do we know factually from the CDC and from other doctors who've looked at this particular COVID-19 virus and other viruses along the way? We know that there is a time frame that those droplets can actually exist on surfaces. And those time frames vary, but it's within a couple of days that they are no longer in extant then on those surfaces. So if you're able to get into the buildings, even in a July, you're ready for your August opening. Just don't allow a lot of other people in there circulating and able to bring in disease that might be along with them if they haven't been tested yet. So that's the macro. Let's start moving down to the micro side of things. We're hearing a lot about obviously making sure we keep that six feet separation in between our students as they're coming in. Not so easy when you've got a class of 30 students in, let's say, a, a 15 by 30 foot room. So some of the things that have been discussed to this point, number one, wearing masks. We've heard a lot of different things about masks. We've even had some of our leaders out there saying differentiated things about masks. Here's what we know. If you're using a, a surgical mask, if you're using some of the masks that have been designed, and, and I thank all of you for who have been designing masks, whether it be for our frontline workers or just individuals within the neighborhood, thank you for doing that. As long as they're triple ply, where you know that things are being stopped, because that's how, again, this virus is spread. It's the droplets coming out, not necessarily the things coming in. We have to be conscious of the fact that to get it ourselves, what often happens is it's us coming in contact with it somewhere and then putting our hands to our face, whether it be by our nasal passages, our eyes, our mouth. And especially for some of our exceptional students, that's a consistent movement, you know, putting their hands in their mouth or putting their hands up to their face. So hand washing is another important thing that we've got to be prepared for when that comes into play. But going back to the idea of masks, We've got to remember with our exceptional individuals that when you've got a mask like this that is going to be designed with ear loops that you put over the ears, for some of our individuals, that is not going to be something that they want on their face at all. And we can't just simply say, oh, just tough it out. They'll be fine. No, because again, we're going through enough transitioning with these students. What you may want to consider is finding someone with a 3D printer and having those mask extenders that you've seen some groups creating. And thank you folks for doing that too. That's been awesome. I've talked to several doctors and nurses who love those because you don't always have the elastic around your ears. What an extender does is it fits on the back of this and basically it just holds things in place behind the head so you don't have that feeling on your ears. And that's a very sensitive area for some of our students. So masks are something that we're seeing a lot of school districts come into. The big 
discrepancy going into masks is how do we make sure our students have them? You know, we have some pockets where it's just not fair to ask our students and our families who are maybe struggling to bring food in right now to also go out and buy masks. So we want to be prepared for that. Maybe start getting in orders now because we're still seeing surge orders coming in for masks along the way. But masks are one thing that we're ready for. You notice too, I said hand washing. Hand washing is essential. We need to start prepping our classrooms. Some of our exceptional classrooms actually have sinks already built in, maybe a bathroom off to the side or a sink within that classroom. Many of our science classrooms already have sinks built in. What about those classrooms that don't have sinks? For our exceptional students, it's important to have something even like a portable sink. Those are available. Those are something that can be wheeled in and wheeled out. They usually have a five gallon water drum underneath that actually allows for students to wash hands throughout the context of the day. And that's something good. In our inclusive classrooms, in our gen ed classrooms, what we want to consider doing is making allowances for restroom breaks throughout the context of the day. Why isn't that taking away from instructional time? Folks, we've been away from instructional time for a long time. We need to understand that instructional time has a different connotation now. So hand washing is going to be important. Hand washing stations are also very important. Don't forget as we're coming in too, you do wanna be looking at hand sanitizers. Non-alcohol based hand sanitizers are going to work with the virus too. So I, I'm just sitting here with some alcohol free safe hands right now. You can be using that as well as your Purell and other things that are out there. If you haven't already taken a look, also take a look at a product called TheraWorks. TheraWorks is absolutely amazing. I've seen this demonstrated and it's been very helpful for our exceptional individuals and very helpful for some of our athletes and our adults too, especially our seniors out there. TheraWorks is so safe that not only can you put it on your hands, you can literally rub it on your face. And I've seen some of our frontline workers actually rub it in their noses just a little bit. And it's going to protect the skins and the hands for an extended period of time. So it's not just sanitizing, but it's also protecting. So that's another thing you wanna consider as you go in, as you're getting things back have something like TheraWorks in there too, or at least your typical hand sanitizers. I know some groups have made them. Please be careful where you're buying some of these things from. Always check what the ingredients are. You don't wanna bring in something that a group has made, but is not putting it up to good health codes as they're putting things in. Other things when it comes to our classrooms, how do we set them up? How do we keep our kids six feet apart? That's difficult sometimes. But one of the things that you want to consider is what we refer to as the parking lot arrangement of a classroom. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that we are talking about having students at diagonal positions as they're moving along so that they're not sitting face to face, that they're not all sitting in a strict row where the child behind can sneeze and something can come forward whether they're offset. Why is it set that parking lots so often are diagonal spaces? Because it's easier to get in and get out of. You're not having to come and cut corners hard. So it actually has advantages. The other advantage that has and that leads to is directional movement within a classroom. With our exceptional students, that's wonderful. Take some arrows, put them down on the ground so that the students know which way they need to be moving. If our students are in wheelchairs, that's great. They can be moving their wheelchairs around in specific areas. So it's not just always going in. We're seeing that today. Well, we're supposed to be seeing that in a lot of the grocery stores and other stores that are open. It's always amazing when you've got people, a group of people walking down the correct way and one or two people coming the opposite way going, what? So we want that idea of directional movement going into play too, and that's easily done. Just set some arrows or directions or footprints, whatever you've got on the ground in front of you to have those students moving forward. What about daily cleanups? What about things like that? What else are we going to be thinking about when we think about our classrooms? 
if you are cleaning up things or for those of you again dealing with hygiene within your exceptional classrooms just have some extra gloves set aside please be careful because of again this surge purchasing that's been going on gloves are something too that may take a little bit of time to get in so what you want to do is order as early as possible some other things to be aware of you folks know I love my Clorox hydrogen peroxide wipes. Why do I love them? Hydrogen peroxide is actually a great way not only to kill germs, but also a way that you can be cleaning up something or even cleaning a fidget of that that a child's going to put right back into their mouths. We definitely don't want bleach types of cleaners for something like that. So hydrogen peroxide wipes, when those come in, because again, we're dealing with so many people have bought things along the way. When those come in, Get some, have those ready in your classroom. What happens if you don't have something like that? What else can you be using to clean some of those fidgets that may have fallen on the ground or may have been played with by somebody and need to be cleaned? Take them over to the sink. Believe it or not, there are antibacterial dish soaps that are out there. So I've got my palm olive right here it, and you notice it's being used because I use it every day, but that's what I normally use. I either use that or I use Dawn. I like the idea of using at first some of the antibacterial ones as we move forward so that again we've got things that are clean but they're being sterilized in the same way that our dishes and plates and cups are. And therefore when that child, after you've dried it off, that child goes and puts it back in their mouth or plays around with it. We're not worried about other residues and what goes on with that. What about other cleanups? You know, let's say we can't get those wipes. One of the amazing things to me that I've seen when we go into stores is everybody automatically goes for the bleach-based products. Great, we understand that those are products that work well. If you can't find them, take a look at some of the other good old-fashioned things that we have. This is just a bottle of pine salt, and there's, there's other types of cleaners like this that are still... 99.9 .9 plus percent effective on germs and bacteria. So there are other things out there that we can have within our classroom as we're getting ready for that. The most important thing that we've got to recall, and you're gonna see this, and I'll bring this back up for a second because it's right here at the bottom. The most important recommendation I can give is keep in mind the mental health of our students and your own well-being too as we come in. Don't overstress this, don't overthink this. Just take in what it is that's being recommended and take in what's being given to you. And then recognize that our first couple of weeks back, it's going to be establishing routines. That's the most important thing that will happen. I know we wanna get back in, we wanna be able to get back to the whole idea of teaching. But remember, education comes from the Latin, a duco, which means to lead forth. So one of the things we can be leading forth in those first couple of weeks are the ideas of how to actually be more hygienic within a classroom, how to actually take care of issues that may come into play when there are health issues, and the mental health and well-being, creating an environment where our students and our teachers can actually feel safe and secure, knowing that the learning is going to be coming along because we're ready to get back in and adjust to our classes. So just some ideas as you're doing your classroom preparation. It doesn't have to really be anything major, but it is different than what we've done in the past. We're not just turning in textbooks, getting a, turning in that list of the book numbers, and then saying, okay, I'll be back in the fall and set everything up again. We do have to think a little bit differently now as we come in, but we don't need to overthink this. We need to be ready for our kids first and foremost. Thank you. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at rheipp at schoolhealth.com.